that which become of sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. As I repair, prepared, as I prepared to receive what the Lord had for me to give to you from these, what turns out to be apocalyptic, messianic, and eschatological passages, I couldn't help but hear the words of our Lord as I prepared. The word of Matthew 24 and 35, where Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. This, this, this last and final message that the prophet Hagar gave us on that he preached to us is loaded. It's loaded. Matter of fact, it's so loaded and it's so full. Um that I don't hardly I, I, I struggle with knowing where to start. It was in the month of December and it was on the 20 and 24th day of that month. The year was 520 B.C. It is as though this prophet who already had a brief career, that guy only preached for three months with this brief career, and for the senior citizens, by the time God called Haggai, he was a senior citizen. Haggai lived um, when the Jews were taken into exile, into Babylon. By the time he wrote this book, some 86 years prior. He lived through the 70 years of captivity. They'd been released to rebuild the temple and the, the, the work stoppage had taken place for 16 years. And this man of God lived through it all. And in his senior years, the Lord called him to preach. Isn't that something? It goes to show that no matter who you are, if God has something for you, Amen. The best is yet to come. Don't let the devil talk you out. Don't let, the, don't let the enemy convince you that it's time for you to just go sit on the shelf somewhere. You have nothing else to offer. When the Lord is through with you, the Lord will take you home. Until then, work. Serve in the church. Amen. Find a niche. Find somebody to help. Don't stay home. And sit in those four walls all day. You'll die before your time. Yes, Studies show that retirement is not all that it's cracked up to be. Many executives retire and within a year they're gone. You know, they find out that going fishing loses its novelty in a few weeks. Find out that they have more time to spend with the kids and the grandkids only to find out that the kids and the grandkids built an entire life based on them being at work. <laughs> so they don't have but so much time for you. All right? The wife, if she's still living, or the husband, whichever the executive is, uh, she had grown accustomed to him being gone all day. After a while, all he hears are questions like, don't you have somewhere to go? Right. 
Life is funny, isn't it? The thing about life is it has to be lived. And so you have to, you have to follow God. My point, you, you, can't, you, 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 have to, you have to work. Amen. Jesus said that. And, uh, Jesus said in John uh, chapter 9 and verse 4, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. This elderly preacher was running out of time. Our Lord said this just one day before his crucifixion. John 13 and 1, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world and go to the Father, it was then that he had the Last Supper in the upper room with his disciples. And it was there that he washed their feet, literally hours from the crucifixion. If the prophet didn't know that he was running out of time, certainly God knew it. Ecclesiastes 8 and 8 says, There is no man that have the power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. What does the scripture mean? When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. When your time is up, amen. Uh, you, can't, you can't retain the spirit, when the spirit of life, when the Lord says, I'm taking you home. Are you with me? Amen. Um, this time, what, what reason I'm mentioning this is that something interesting happens at this point in the prophet's life. On this day, the 24th day of the month, God gives Haggai two visions. Amen. Verse 20 says, Again, the word of the Lord came in the 4 and 20th day of the month. So what month was it? Was it? Well, verse 10 tells us that it was in the 20th. It was in the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month. Verse 18, you see where he, he tells them, verse 18, consider now from this day upward, from the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month. So in the ninth month, according to our reckoning, it was the month of December. On December the 24th, God gives this man two visions. The first vision, I preached about it last Sunday. On verse 10, he gives them a vision and shows them that holiness is not contagious. But evil is. That's why the Bible says that we got to be careful what company we keep. The Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. Parents, teach this to your children. Parents used to, they used to do it. In black community, we, we want to know that when you see a child, first thing you ask, who, this, who are their parents? What kind of family do they have? Praise the Lord. Who are your people? Child come from a, a family full of, full of crazies. Parents tell you right then, you can't play with them. They all messed up. And the likelihood that this was going to be messed up is very high. So I don't want to risk my child being messed up. But that was back in the day when parents wanted to be their children's parent and not necessarily their children's friend 
Amen. Many of you were saved like the Bible says. And we allowed the wrong company to corrupt us. That was the first message that he gave on the 24th day of December, uh, 520 B.C. But verse 20 tells us that God speaks again. And the reason we know that it's the ninth month is because of what I've just gone over. Verse 18, it's the ninth month. Verse 10, it's the ninth month. But in verse 20, it says in the four and twentieth day of the month. That's, that, that means the same month. When dealing with pro proper Bible interpretation. So he had given that this was in the month of December. And he and 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 if my study is correct, that this is the only time. This was the only time that he gave two visions. Uh, on the same day, in the same month. Praise the Lord. So, again, reminiscent of our Lord. Our Lord, 18 months, just 18, um, six months, excuse me, from the crucifixion. Six months out. Jesus knowing that in six months, he will be dead. Takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. He stands in a location where behind him would be gleaming, glistening images of false gods. He stands at a time where the sunlight would greatly magnify these images. Six months out. And he says to his disciples, he asked them, oddly enough, two questions that day. Just as the Lord gives Hagar two visions that day. He says, who do men say that I am? That was the first question. The second question was, who do you say that I am? What was he doing? Gauging the effectiveness of the ministry. Who, who's got it? Who understands this? Because in six months, I've got to leave all of this. At least for three days. In these men's hands. So who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? You can read it respectfully. Matthew 16 and 13, the last clause, and verse 15, the B clause. In our text, we see two visions on the same day. The book of Haggai begins on a discouraging and on a depressing note. But it ends with an uplifting and promising one. The first, it began, if you recall, on a note of indictment. Chapter 1, verse 2 says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Verse 4, uh, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. It was disappointing and depressing that they would go there and let the enemy stop them from building God's house. And then the preachers, I've talked about this, began to preach that it wasn't time to build God's house. And Haggai checked them with the God first message. He says, but is it time for you to go build your house, your palatial palaces with your uh, nice lawns and you, you're into your world while you leave the work of God undone? Where is the Lord on your list of priorities? 
What does your time say about God on your list? What does your checkbook say about God on your list of priorities? What does our prayer life say about the Lord on our list of priorities? Most of us today are too busy for God. We're too busy. You know, we don't have time for the Lord. We don't have time for church. We don't have time to spend all day <laughs> before the Lord. And there is a, uh, a relaxed, a, um, a apathetic approach. We seem to have lost our sense of urgency. So the prophet rebukes them, and they began to, they, they responded favor, favorably. I must add this. But this last one is the great, is of a great and blessed future. This last, this last message for the people of God. Amen. Now we all know that the fulfillment was much farther away than either Hagar or Zerubbabel thought. So let's look at this last message. The first thing we notice is that the last message is for the entire body of Christ. It blesses all Israel. It blesses the kingdom of the world. It deals with governments. It deals with uh, world leaders, present and future. But it is to Zerubbabel. Notice the scriptures carefully. Verse 20 says, Again the word of the Lord came unto Hegai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. The message was to him. Why Zerubbabel? Number one, he was the leader. Anytime God gets ready to speak to a people, God speaks to the leader first. The direction of the church comes through the leader. Others who are appointed to assist, assist, but they're not the ones who promote the vision or the tone or the tenor, tenor or the temperature for the church. That is the responsibility of the leader. Zerubbabel was the governor. Praise the Lord. And at the time when he wrote to him, are you praying for me? Um, Zerubbabel, secondly, was concerned about the community, about the neighborhood, about neighboring nations, their governments, and what would become of these few and feebled Jews, and how such a poor prince such as himself, could keep his ground and serve his country. Zerubbabel had great feelings of inadequacy. Amen. That's, one, that's another reason why he spoke to him. And also, I add that Zerubbabel was a direct descendant of our Lord. You look at Matthew's gospel chapter 1, you will see that Zerubbabel was in the descendancy, in the family line of our Lord. It says in one, Matthew 1 and verse 11, and Joshua begat Jeconiah and his brethren. Josiah begat Jeconiah and his brethren. And about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begat Shealtel. Shealtel, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, Shealtel, transliteration. And Shealtel begat 
Zerubbabel, who was Zerubbabel. So this man was in the direct family line of our Lord. Amen. And so the message comes to him. And when the Lord says to him, it'll come together in just a minute, I'm going to shake this world. This message is on the heels of the former message. And the former message concluded with a powerful word of blessing. The last clause of verse 19 says, from this day, Will I bless you? Now, what is the point? Because he tells him in verse 19, I'm going to bless you. Then God speaks to Hagar again and tells him to tell Zerubbabel, uh, I'm going to shake the whole earth, the heavens and the earth. What is the message that he was sending? He was telling Zerubbabel, loosely hang on to the perishable things of this life. I know that I just told you that I'm going to bless you. And I am. Matter of fact, get ready for a bumper crop. Get ready for me to give you things. Prepare for me to bless Judah. Hallelujah. Because you're obeying me, gone are those days where you'll put money in your pockets, but it'll be like bags with holes in them. Because you're going to obey me, gone are the days of me blowing on the money that you manage to get home. Because you're going to obey me, there's a reversal. You will eat and get full, clothe and be warm. I'm going to bless you. But with my blessing you, the new message says you have to watch your association with the blessings. You can't grab hold to the things that I'm about to give you and hold them too close. Some of us Cling too closely to the things of this life. Praise the Lord. You're going to say amen. Some of us are Christians, but we're carnal. All we think about is the here and now. All we think about are things that pertain to this life. Oh my. Oh my. Some of you, oh, you're dead. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Praise the Lord. The carnal Christian is dead. That is the Christian who is worldly. The Christian who lacks the ability to put things in their proper place. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Not only seek those things and set your affection. For those who took English, you know that the word you is understood. And you set your affection. See, you got to uh, guide your affection. Well, I'm not interested in spiritual things. Make yourself interested. Praise the Lord. You got to know how to grab your own self in the collar. Well, it seems like to me, Pastor, those things don't come to me as easily as they come to you. Number one, you don't know whether they come to me easily or not. But number two, if they do, don't come to you easily, then you've got to be adult enough and spiritual enough, have grown in Christ enough to put spiritual things 
first. Some of us, our affection is on homes, cars, money, suits, dresses, relationships, children, grandchildren, all careers, all car those kinds of things. You just eat up with that stuff. Praise the Lord. It occupies all your time. I'm preaching better than you are saying amen. It, it occupies all your time. Praise the Lord. It's what keeps you up late at night. When the last time you woke up praying for souls? When's the first time you woke up saying, Lord, draw me nearer? Oh, no. You have your career. Oh, no. You have your relationships. Oh, no. You are entangled with the affairs of this life. The Bible says, and let us lay aside every sin. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily entangle us or trip us up. Instead of laying these things aside, we are taking these things on. He said, I'm, I'm, I feel something. He said, set your affection on things, not on things on the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with God in Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. There are some things, excuse me, in this world, we won't be the best at. There are some things in this world we won't be number one. You may not, if you make it to the NBA, you, you, you may not be MVP as many times as your unsaved counterpart whose ability is no better than yours, but you may not get it as many times as they will get it because you can't set all of your affection on that because you, you know that, that, that the Lord don't want you to go but so far. Because once you cross a certain line, it becomes idolatry. That thing becomes your God, all right? You won five NBA titles, but when was the last time you went to prayer meeting? Oh, oh, it, it's coming through. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're the best in the world, but, the, but to get that good, you had to set Affection that should have been given to God to those things. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, you don't get, you won't get MVP then. Oh no, that's for the man who decided that he wouldn't become an idolatry to be the best. Oh, this thing is something. See, now, 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 the, the truth that I'm preaching now will dawn on some of you six months from now. That, 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 see, the Lord requires and demands a certain amount of our time. See, see, amen. And, 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 and it's a highway to heaven. And there are certain, certain things you can't do if you want to go to heaven. Certain lines you won't cross. So you may not get the TV commercial. You may not get the notoriety. And while the world is applauding that person, you've got to be all right with. You've got to be joyful with. You've got to be happy with. 
I could have done that had I been willing to go that far. But there was a governor in me. There was a, there was a keeper in me. And while I was out there training one day, training, the Holy Ghost said, when was the last time you visited me? I cut my running short to spend time before the Lord. While I was preparing for whatever it is, the Bible said, when was the last time you read me? So I had to walk away from that and go to the word because, you see, if I don't watch myself, my affection, my affection would take me and into all wonder. I'm getting ready to rebuke somebody. I'm trying to preach here. All this money. Praise the Lord. Now, amen. Your affections can take you places that you have no business going. You can go deep. Praise the Lord. Mess, mess around and get lost. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about in drugs. I'm talking about lost in accounting. Lost in physics. Physicists. Physicisms and lost in trying to be, praise the Lord, whatever it is. To be the best lawyer, to be the best doctor, to, to be the most successful. You, you pursue it so much that you, when you miss, you don't even feel guilty. You don't even feel conviction. You have allowed your affections to pull you so deep. You're, it, has, it has pulled you away from Christ. And you don't even know it. My dear friend, Superintendent John McCluckin, told me that he was with the late Superintendent Otis Lockett one day. And he told this publicly. And he said Superintendent Lockett was having some custom suits made. And McCluckin was with him. And Superintendent Lockett said to him, hey man, let me have a couple of shirts made for you. And McCluckin said, and he looked at Lockett and said, I have two kids in college. I have this, that, and the other that I'm working on right now. He said, there's no need for me to let you do this for me, to put me in a position where I can get used to the feel of something like this. When I'm not, y'all pay attention? Huh? When, when I'm not in a position where I can keep that going. He said so. Oh, he was so wise. He said so. I turned this down. I turned this down because it's not time yet for me to walk in this because my affections, my affections, will get locked up in that stuff. Praise the Lord. It's like, it's like the guy who goes into preaching because he sees the, the preacher's big car. He didn't see the hoopty that the preacher started with. You just see what he's driving after 40 years of preaching. Your affections are in the wrong place. That, you know what? That stuff can disqualify you. I, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a seminar with the pastors, the ministers, the elders, and evangelists when they come. Some of you, you disqualify. God can't let you start small because you've got yourself too big. The Bible says, let he that minister wait on his ministry. Wait and you, you train for what God is doing. You can get ahead. You can get ahead of your scheme. Lord called me and said, candor. I could start there. It was small. I could start there because I was small myself. 
And I wouldn't be here if I hadn't have been able to start there. But it would be difficult being here to go there now. You got to control your affection. You got to know when to say no thank you. Say amen. You got to know when to say, you know what? This is above me. What y'all doing? This is above me. Praise the Lord. I can't let my heart and my mind get into this because it will pull me away from the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, you sin. Your affections. You see, the Lord said to uh, Zerubbabel, yes, I'm going to bless you. But don't cling too tight to what I'm going to give you because I have something else to say. I'm getting ready to shake this whole world. I'm going to shake up everything. See, the blessed saint got to keep a relationship with their blessing while they can serve the Lord if the Lord takes the blessings away. You, you, can't, you, can't let, you can't let the comforts of your blessed state spoil you. That what Paul meant when he says, I, I learned to preach for the Lord full, and I've learned to preach for the Lord hungry. I've learned to preach for the Lord when you all were paying me, and I learned to preach for the Lord when you wasn't. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. That is, I can preach for the Lord in any situation, whether I have an amen corner or not, whether I get paid right or not. I've, I've positioned myself where whatever happens, I can do the will of the Lord. Don't you cling too close. Don't, don't hold too closely to what God have given you. Yes, sir. Some of us, we've grown so accustomed to central air that if the church is a little too warm or just a little too hot or a little too cool, you can't take it. Ain't no point in the Lord sending you on no evangelism trip. You know, you know, we're born. My, my evangelists, you know, certain folk ain't, ain't only taking them. They can't separate. They can't separate from the fineries. They can't even function without fake lashes. They can't function without foundation. They can't function without. They got to have. You got to be a diva or or or, or a debutante on a missionary journey. Praise the Lord. In some of these journeys, you don't even have deodorant. You got to be able to function and not at your best. Praise the Lord. You got to have a, a word from the Lord. Amen. Without having all these other things that you got to have. And the day will come when the Lord will test you. Praise the Lord. I remember when I got my first Lincoln, years ago. Ain't no need of you falling out. You didn't pay for it. <laughs> years ago, a black Lincoln town car with a red stripe down the side with reddish burgundy crushed velvet interior. And in those days, the town car was the preacher car. They didn't know how to believe you were called to preach unless you had a town car. And I got me a nice used one. <laughs> Amen. You know how I got the town car? The marquee I was driving, it broke down on the lot right in front of the town car. So I said, well, this must be God. <laughs> so, amen. So when the car blowed up in front of the town car. I said, well, I guess the Lord wanted me to have this town car. And, and I, it worked out. It turns out the dealer had used the town car for hauling. And all that, but it, but I, it, listen, I, I enjoyed it. I was so thankful. So I'm in my town car, and one day I had went somewhere preaching, and on the way back, a young lady drove through an intersection, 
and she, we wrecked the car. And I'll never forget, uh, the, the, the devil spoke to me and, and said, aha, you know, the devil's stupid. And uh, he said, I got you now. He said, because you don't have that preacher's car. I said to the devil, I, I had this wisdom uh, in my early 20s. I said to the devil, Satan, before I got that car, it was just a car. When it became my car, that's what made it a preacher's car. And devil, I was preaching when I was walking. And if I have to walk now, I'm still a preacher. Because the car don't make the preacher. The preacher makes the car. Don't you let what God has given you define you. You define it. And you give glory to the giver of all things who is the Lord God Almighty. The Lord of hosts. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Somebody lift your hands and give praises to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Your greatest title ought to be that of being a saint. I'm a saint of God. I'm a movie star. I'm a saint of God. I'm an elected official, but I'm a saint of God. I'm a lawyer, yeah, but I'm a saint. I am a saint of the most high God. Good God Almighty. I'm a professional athlete. Good for you, but I'm a saint of God. Oh, oh Lord, there's nothing like being saved and nothing like having a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So he tells Zachariah, I'm getting ready to shake up everything. I'm going to shake up the heavens and I'm going to shake up the earth. And then, he, and then in, in verse 22, he gives them a verse that's filled with I, I, I from verse 21 to verse 23. God uses the word I six times. Other words, what's getting ready to happen is by divine power. Good God Almighty, I want to tell somebody today that the divine power of the Lord is in your life. And the things that the devil has said, things that Satan said wouldn't get better. Things that Satan said wouldn't move. Things that Satan said are impre impregnable. I want you to know that when the Lord is on your side, God is able to do what the devil said couldn't be done. Don't you limit yourself to the diagnosis of the doctor. Don't you limit yourself by the preset goals and standards of other people. They may tell you that you'll never be anything, that you'll never amount to anything. You got to learn how to shake that off. You got to learn how to ignore that stuff and decide that you're gonna go for God because we serve the one who determines the outcome of all things. I want you to know that when the God of the Bible is your secret weapon, you have an advantage over the enemy. You have an advantage over the adversary. I challenge somebody to team up with God. Let the Lord be your tag team partner. Let the Lord be your leader. Let the Lord show you the way. He is a mighty good leader. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Somebody praise him, if you will. Why don't, you just, why don't you just thank the Lord and say, I'm getting ready for my shaking. I'm getting ready for my shaking. Zerubbabel, he was discouraged because he had little power. He had a small military. He had little help. And thank God for the tag team partner of Hagar, who was the prophet Zechariah. This is why Zechariah spoke to Zerubbabel and said, not by might, not by power, 
but by my spirit, saith the Lord. No, I don't have the money. No, you don't have the know-how. No, you don't have the ability, but you don't need might. You don't need power. All you need is the spirit of the Lord. Ah! Ah, Lord! Ah, Lord! Do I have anybody here who can say, I have the Holy Ghost on the inside and the God I serve, he's able, he's able. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He shook him up, and then, and then, when he spoke to him in verse 22, verse 22 is filled with what I call word, word bombs, word bombs, B O M B S, explosions. In verse 22, he said, and I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms. When he threw out the word overthrow, the recipients of the letter knew that he was describing using the same word that God used to bring down Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed those cities with an overthrow. He said, I'm going to overthrow the kingdoms of the world, the throne of the kingdoms. I want you to know that all kingdoms, all nations, the Russians, the Brazilians, hallelujah, the Venezuelans, the United States, all nations are in his hands. He's still in charge. He said, I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathens and I will overthrow the chariots and then he gave a reference to how he drowned Pharaoh's army and he said those that ride in them the horse and their riders shall come down you remember when God drowned Pharaoh's army Moses began to sing that the horse and his rider got drowned in the sea. I want to tell somebody, I'm just like the song that said, Oh Mary, don't you weep and tell Martha not to moan because Pharaoh's army got drowned in the sea. Other words, if he's got enough to drown Pharaoh, Pharaoh's army, then he's got enough to take care of Mary and Martha. And if he's able to take care of Mary and Martha, he's able to take care of you and me. So all saints, don't weep. Saints, don't moan for the same God who drowned Pharaoh's army. He's still God today. He's still able. Yeah, yes. Somebody shout, he's the same God. He's the same God. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Lord. Woo. Mm. And I heard him say, he brought down, gave him the word bomb, overthrow. He talked about the riders, and then he mentioned the sword. 
because in verse 22 in the last clause he says and the horse and their riders shall come down everyone by the sword now remember the Jewish people they knew their history and when he mentioned the word sword their mind went back to the mighty mighty man of God Gideon who destroyed the enemy with the sword you got to know how to hear the word of God mm -hmm. you got to know when the Lord is getting ready to move he's getting ready to move he's telling us to get right with him and then I heard him say in my clothes he said in that day saith the Lord of hosts I will take thee O Zerubbabel and a son of Shealtel and I will make you my signet ring the ring the signet ring of a leader was the same as a crown the same as a robe the same as a scepter he said I'm going to give you a robe and crown I'm going to anoint you and make you special well I'm glad that the promises that he gave Zerubbabel were connected to the promises that he gave to David which were connected to the promises that he gave to Abraham and the New Testament tell me that when we get saved we become children of Abraham we become heirs of the same promise so the same signet the same power the same authority the same authenticity that God gave to Rubabel the Lord has given to you and me all we got to do is stand on the word declare our power good God Almighty do I have anybody here who will stand on the word of God while I'm preaching and just begin to rebuke and bind rebuke and bind the devil right now just begin to tell him get your hands off me get your hand out of my family get your hand out of my head get 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 loose 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Go on and get your praise, brother. Thank you, Jesus. You gotta get free. Thank you, Jesus. You gotta get free because I come to tell you that all this stuff, it's not worth it because everything is going down. But the word of God, everything he's gonna shake up the heavens and the earth. So it's time to get ready. It's time to get prepared. It's time to get revived. It's time. Oh, it's time. Yeah, Lord. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. It's going down. Grab somebody by the hand and tell them it's going down. That car you're riding in, that home you're living in, that suit you're wearing, even your body, everything is going down. Yeah, but the word of God You gotta grab your Bibles, wave your Bibles. I'm glad that I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm glad that my hope is built on the Word of God. I'm glad 
that I believe from Genesis to Revelation. I'm glad. Oh, hey, 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 Lord, because everything, everything, hallelujah, is going down. Well, preacher, my whole life, my whole life, it's tied in my wonderful marriage. It's going down. Because if you live long enough, when are you going to die? Everything. When the Lord says I'm going to shake the heavens and shake the earth, let me tell you something. I said in the opening that these words were apocalyptic, messianic, and eschatological. Apocalyptic dealing with the last days. Messianic. Because actually, these things will be fulfilled not in the human Zerubbabel, but in Christ, whose family line he was a part of. And eschatological deal with last days. Last days. Last things. So, so Hagar Pam, went beyond this day. He, that old man looked past us and saw what God is going to do and is yet doing and yet to do. But he gives us all a warning. Even though it's going to bless you. It's going to bless you. Don't cling too tight. You remember the people, I think it was Gideon. They, they made Gideon an ephod. I think it was Gideon. Am I right? And the Bible teaches, was it Gideon or Jephthah? The Bible teaches that the thing became a uh, hindrance to him. Who was that? Praise the Lord. Let me see if I can. It was a, it was a Jephthah. It was a blessing. But it became a hindrance. Oh, God. Lord, I thank you. Hallelujah. To the book. Go to the book of Judges. Where's my, where my glasses? Thank you, Jesus. This one. Oh, my. Oh, my. If one of my fine scholars find it before me, that'll be fine. Glory to God. Uh, it became a hindrance it got in the way I think it was Gideon 8 and 22 is that, where, is that where it is 8 and 27 listen to this and Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city even in Ophrah. And all Israel went there a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and his house. Don't let God blessing you to be physically attractive, to be a snare to you. Don't let the Lord's blessings of giving you finances. Let that become a snare to you. Don't let a testimony of how the Lord healed your body become a snare to you. See, how does it become a snare? When we began to worship and pay more attention to that thing than the giver of that thing. Hallelujah. When it becomes a snare, then it's a problem. We don't worship anybody but the God of the Bible. And, and you can't worship what he has given you. Enjoy what he's given you. But you can't make a shrine out of it. I just love this chair. This is my favorite chair. This is my favorite chair. It ought to be your favorite chair. It ought to be your favorite chair. But during, during church time, your favorite chair ought to be empty. Because you, 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 you ought to be sitting in your first favorite chair. 
and that's anywhere in the service of the Lord. You don't let it become a snare to you. You don't let it become what it shouldn't be. Any relationship that comes between you and the Lord, you, got to, you, can't, you can't keep that. You have to cut that because you, it will become a snare. And if well, it hadn't snared yet, stay with it. <laughs> because Samson would not do away with his relationship with Delilah, his relationship with Delilah did away with him. So even in the Lord's blessings and, and, and with the anointings and all of the things that God is doing, he says, now don't, don't get too, too attached. Don't get too attached. Don't, don't get too, too attached. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm going to shake everything up. And you know what it tells me? That if it's God, when he's giving it to you, putting it on loan to you, it's still got to be God when he shake it away from you. Amen. Amen. The Lord have given and the Lord have taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So he tells us, don't get too attached because everything is going down. Let me let me close with with with, with this particular passage. I want to show you something that that just cements this case. I, I I couldn't do this part in high gear. Second Peter chapter three. See, I hadn't ended the sermon yet. I'm closing now. This is my closing note. Mm, glory. Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as, is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. I know that I promised this back in Haggai. Hadn't happened yet, but I'm not slack concerning my promises, as some men count slackness. And the word slack, that slackness is literally tardiness. The Lord is not late. He's not tardy. But long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should, should come to repentance. But... The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which, here it is, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. While I was studying this, I looked, I, I, I called uh, uh, Patricia in my office and uh, uh, I had her to look out the, the, the window. Uh, and my 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 car was sitting there. And no, I was I was talking to Rock Rocky. Was that what we were talking? Was that you? And I said, "Look at that car sitting there. It's got a date with destiny. Sitting there shining. On its way to melting with fervent heat. Look at it. Look at these clothes. Oh, it fit the best I can get them to fit." But they got a date with melting, with fervent heat. Can I get a witness? Then the Lord took me one further. Said, your body. It has a date. Oh, that's not your forever. It is my body. I do what I want with my body. It's your body for now. And depending upon how you treat it and how you do with God, you might not have it for long. All of it shall melt. Look at this. 
with fervent heat. The earth also, now we're talking about the heavens, the earth also, and the works that are therein. All of the, we are building, go to Durham, you go to Cary, Raleigh, New York, we are building like we're here to stay forever. You see all of these monuments that suggest permanence. All of them have a date. The works that are therein shall be burned up. Okay, seeing then. Now notice the, see, the, the scriptures depend on people having common sense. So, so scripture says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Not might. I hate to throw this in, but this building. Your mama's house. Seeing then that all these things, not maybe, but shall be dissolved. I mean, I, I mean this, see, it's common sense. Bible is, I'm, I'm just holding out. I'm not ready yet. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and God? Since you see everything going down but the word of God, what you out there hoeing for? Why are you out there selling drugs? Why are you still drinking? Why are you still so wrapped up in your career that it has become a God to you? Why are you so tied up in stuff that's temporary? You spend more time on your hat we do then in the scripture. Just sit there uh, all day. Four hours later, they still burning, spreading, it. <laughs> or or braiding. And you don't spend you don't spend a modicum of that time in the scripture. You gonna lose that hair anyway. How do you know? Because you're going to die. And go, go dig up all dead bodies. Their hair is still in the casket. The hair is laying right there. It, does, it doesn't go with you in the next life. I, I, I'm using extreme examples to show how silly People are how mixed up we are and how the scripture reasons with us and expect us to be a little smarter. You know, just apply a little common sense. Here's common sense. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person ought you to be in a holy conversation and godliness? What you're looking for? Looking for. And hastening, looking for and hastening unto, that is, hastening the coming of the day of God. You, you, you won't, you, you're looking forward to this shaking. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such Things, new heaven, new earth, you know what's going to happen. You know that everything's going to be dissolved, right? Well, he says, be diligent. Get in a hurry. Be diligent. Make every effort. Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace. 
without spot, found of him in peace without spot and without blame. Now that is what we should be working on with everything that we got in us. Lord, I'm working on myself so I can be found in you. I, I, I want to be found in you with peace between you and me. I want to be found without spot. Spot there, stain. Stain uh, represents moral failures. Garments soiled by the flesh. Stain without spot and without, look at this, and blameless. Bear in mind and account that, bear in mind that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom, to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you. He says, and consider that the reason that the Lord have not come back yet, don't assume that he's slack concerning his promises. But just know that he's patient trying to give all of us time. But time is running out. It ran out on Hagar. It's going to run out on you. It's going to run out on me. We need to make sure that our priorities are where they should be. Don't spend your, remember what he said in Isaiah? Why spend your money buying that which is not bread? See how it comes back? See, you're spending all your time on temporary things. Relationships, they ain't going to last no way. Praise the Lord. Uh, Mother Kendall, she's in heaven now. Honey, you were related to Mother Kendall, a great aunt. From time to time, I, I hope whoever lived there don't hear this, but from time to time, I drive by the house where Mother Kendall used to live. If there, you, well, let me rephrase this. You would have been hard pressed to find a operating room that was cleaner than Mother Kendall's house. Stayed spot. And everything stayed nice. And Mother Kendall kept her yard right. Even the flowers slanted in the right direction. <laughs> she was just, just that way. And she loved the Lord. And she loved the Lord until the Lord took her home. <laughs> and no one could imagine in those days that that house, would look like it looks now. You didn't think it would be possible. The difference is, mother's gone. Those things that you so cherish today that you can't live without. You remember Mother Kendall? Mother Kendall, that was your, huh? It's your aunt. Yeah, yeah, your aunt. Am I right? All these things that we're just Selling our souls over. We're going to leave those things. Solomon said, you don't know whether your children are going to take over and keep the, keep the company going or not. And the whole thing go in the ground. And that's all of your works. Because you put it, put the wrong priority on those things. I want to pray for some people my time is up. I got to go to Asheville. I got four hours ahead of me. Then I'm going to go up there and preach. I'm going to make them aware of some things. But I want to pray today, today for people who want prayer that God would help them set their affections on things that are above. Lord, I, 
I don't come today for things. I, 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 I'm not praying today for material things. I, I, want, I want prayer that my heart and my mind is in the right place. That since the things that are going to happen are going to happen, I want to be uh, in the right spiritual place. Hallelujah. I went to the house where I used to live. The grass had grown up and covered up the door. Someone from across the street said, I know who, who you see. He said, they, they don't live here anymore. Mm -hmm. Then I went. Where I used to go, the preacher was still there, and he met me at the door. He said, I know who you are, and I know who you're looking for he said they they don't come here anymore oh no he said they are somewhere around the throne of God they are somewhere around the throne of God. So I'll keep searching and searching till someday I'll find. But there's somewhere. destiny. Lord God, this earth has a destiny. Every stoplight, every community, every thoroughfare, hallelujah, every path, Mount Rushmore, the Eiffel Tower, the Rock of Gibraltar, Lady Liberty, Stone Mountain. Yes, Lord. The Golden Gate Bridge. The Sears Tower. The Empire State Building. Oh, God. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. My home. My city, my town. My nation. We all have a date with destiny. My body. My life, my family, all oh, Jesus, all these things will be dissolved. God, give us to be thankful for all of your provisions, but to worship none of them. Be thankful for our careers, but to only go as far as being faithful to you will allow us to go. God, give us to represent you, to love you, 
and to hold with a loose grip all that you've given us. For we know, Lord, that it's all on loan and it will all be taken away. For the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. God, keep our hearts and our minds in the right place. Everything's going down but your word. So God, give us strength now to set our affections, set our affections, your thoughts, all oh, that's on your mind, your thoughts, your inclination, inclinations, the things that we long for, lust after, redirect, you do it, redirect, envy, strife, jealousy, lust, Anger, first redirect me. You do it. You do it. Set your affection. Set your affection. You do it. You do it. You, 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 you. Today, decide today. I'm not thinking like that anymore. I'm not going that way. I'm just not. You do it. Set your affection on things that are above. Praise the Lord. You ought to let everything be taken. Say, well, well, who, 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 who bought my time? Who took my place? The Lord did. Set your affection. Some of us, I'm praying and preaching, I tend to do that. We are guilty of the cares of this life. All that is in the world is the lust of the world. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We're so proud of what we've done in this world. We're so proud of who we are in this world. We're so proud of our stature in this world. But what are you in God's kingdom? Where are you in Christ? I know where we are in the world. But when was the last time you won a soul? When was the last time you spoke in tongues? Why are you in Christ? Oh God. Where are you? Lord, that's the question in my mind. Where am I in you, Lord? So Lord, keep us. Cause your face to shine upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. That's it. That's it.